Disney has always been the king of children's entertainment. Toys, movies, amusement parks, creating lifelong fans that will still cry when Mufasa is holding onto the cliff. Spoilers also, I guess. And in a pre-iPad world, when you were a kid, you would pretty much just watch whatever was on TV. And despite not being a Disney kid myself, I was still naturally going to end up watching a lot of its programming. With today's topic specifically being about Playhouse Disney. Playhouse Disney was a programming block aimed at little babies to around kindergarten age children. And grown man Connor the Waffle. The channel block was launched in 1997 to compete with Nick Jr. And hey, when you're the biggest media corporation of all time who specializes in entertaining children, you definitely have a fighting chance. So today I wanted to go over the shows, specifically shows that were homegrown or popularized on Playhouse Disney. Cartoons like Tailspin, Chippendale, Rescue Rangers, and Little Mermaid, while technically airing on the programming block, I don't want to talk about them in this video specifically. But don't worry, I will down the road. But today, more so just the legacy and impact that Playhouse Disney had. So let's have a fun little trip down memory lane. Alright, well we're starting off pretty strong, I'd say. Bear in the Big Blue House. I'm so glad to see you, and you're just in time. Come on in! In this show, we follow Bear. And he is... in his Big Blue House. A bear's three favorite words are breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Similar to Blue's Clues, it was just a chill slice of life show. Bear and his friends would get into fun shenanigans that usually would teach the viewer at home like the importance of sharing, problem solving, and being kind to others. Here in my home sweet home, I've got my favorite chair, yes in my home sweet home. Oh yeah, it's a Disney property, of course there was going to be loads of songs. And best of all, I get to spend time with you. The costumes and puppet work are really where this show shines. Bear's friends like Ojo, Tutter, Trilo, Pip, and Pop, they're all so cute and make the funniest noises when they talk. But they feel super high quality for a children's show. Wow! Oh, oh great Gouda! And that's because Bear in the Big Blue House was produced by the Jim Henson Company, literally the top tier puppeteers to ever exist. And the way these characters are presented really works well. What I mean by that is like, Bear feels like a sweet old man just wanting to live a super peaceful life. But his friends are so chaotic and usually the driving forces that create a domino effect for today's lesson. Oh, so you're a sailor. Yeah, right. And the coffee table. No, 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 no. I'm pretending. Oh, I see. Ojo is playing pretend. Also, Bear is the most huggable creature I've ever seen. He always has this perpetual smile and gentle demeanor in his voice. I would literally give my left leg just to hug him for three seconds. Oh! And when the sun sets and Bear is ready to turn in for the night, at the end of every episode, he steps outside and... Oh, hello, please don't eat me! Bear in the Big Blue House ran from 1997 to 2006. The show's initial run, however, ran from 1997 to 2003, when Lig Thigpen, who voiced Luna the Moon, suddenly passed away putting the show's production on hiatus for three whole years, even needing to cancel a planned movie, apparently. Production would pick up again in 2005, however, reportedly the crew's hearts just weren't in it anymore. It's nice to see that everyone on set genuinely cared for each other. Bear in the Big Blue House ran for four seasons and had 117 episodes. It was nominated and won three Daytime Emmy Awards. It was peak 90s children entertainment. The show had lots of heart, and again, Disney, the offer is still up there for my left leg in exchange for one hug with Bear. Well, thanks for visiting the Big Blue House. And come back soon. Bye. PB and J Otter follows three siblings, all otters, named Peanut, Butter, and Jelly. Bet your dad's bringing us tuna fish ice cream so we can have tuna sundaes with peanut butter and jelly on top. The show is very simple, following the day-to-day -day life of these three kids. Just reading off the episode summaries will immediately give you the vibe of what you're in for. You got insane scenarios like PB&J try to find a sled after they realize they don't have one. Or how about 
Peanut and Jelly try to keep Butter from playing in the mud so they can all stay clean for an upcoming family picture. Yeah, they're all low stakes and super small situations, but as a kid, that's your whole life. These things do feel important when you're that age, because you're not worrying about taxes yet. Let's just go back and play by ourselves. Yeah, we'll have fun without them. Everybody hates us. There's literally an episode where the siblings go berry picking and realize they picked too much and they can't move the basket. The whole episode is just figuring out what to do now and how to get them home. The show was created by Jim Jenkins. And this won't be the last we hear of him, creating more well-known shows under the Playhouse Disney umbrella. He's kind of like the Stan Lee of children's shows. Also being the creator of Doug. When I found that out, PB&J Otter really started to make more sense. Visually, it's very cozy and simple. There's no insane bouncy characters or an overload of stimulation. You know, things that would usually keep a child's attention. They instead just focus on a calm and humble approach. Here's a quote from Jenkins himself when talking about Doug, however, I feel like his words can also apply to PB and J Otter. Doug is not a powerful character. He's more what I feel like kids are today. They are soft-spoken and bewildered. When I was a kid, I'll be honest, I wasn't super into this show, but coming back as an adult with a new perspective really opened my eyes in a way I wasn't expecting. Way up high in the rolling oh. My god, this intro is the most mumbling, low-energy thing ever produced on the television, and it's genuinely a masterpiece. He's roly-poly-oly, he's small and smart and round. roly poly Oli, along with his sister Zoe poly Oli and their parents Mr. Percy Poli and Mrs. Paulina Poli. I managed to do that in one try. The core of the show is pretty much everything I said about PB&J Otter, just kids living their lives and having fun. The main appeal for the show, however, were definitely the visuals. In 1998, seeing a 3D animated show was unheard of. CGI was still fairly new in general, and using that technology for a kid show is beyond impressive. Now don't get me wrong, it's definitely not perfect. Actually kind of reminding me of those bootleg Disney movies like Ratatouille. But hey, if you're three, you're obviously not gonna care. Heck, grown-ass me was still finding it charming. I see green. However, obvious jank aside, they do have tons of fun with this world. The show takes place on the planet Poli, with all the characters being robots. And not roly polies. You know, the bug? What this show is named after? Whatever, I digress. With the show taking place on a fictional planet homed with robots, it allows the world to be as chaotic and insane as you want. Literally anything goes. The polies all live in a giant tea kettle house that has a face. Heck, now that I mention it, so many random objects have faces on them. Why? Who cares? This is just how the planet is. Who are we to judge? That's insensitive. It's fun to watch an episode and count how many random objects in the scene have faces that are just staring you down. A big compliment I'll give the show is that it's very ADHD friendly. The dialogue and plots move incredibly fast. Before you can realize what's going on, there's some kind of crazy robotic device on screen that may or may not give you nightmares. I'll think it's <laughs> time to change the bag. You can tell it's a perfect show for kids because there's nine hour compilations of it on YouTube. Another fantastic show that went on from 1998 to 2003, winning multiple daytime Emmy awards like outstanding special class animated program. Whatever that means. But more importantly, won over the hearts of millions with its addictive theme song. Out of the Box, hosted by Tony and Vivian. The best way I could describe this show is that it was a virtual daycare. Let's climb it and see what's at the top. Yeah. So Matt and his friends began to climb the beanstalk. The duo would play songs, act out plays and skits, as well as make arts and crafts, all with a humble DIY attitude. Great spider, Tony. The show didn't utilize any special effects or have an insane set with wacky fictional characters. It was just two people in their house made of cardboard. It genuinely felt like you were coming over to hang out and do some activities. The side characters were all random children that, you know, they were there. Hey, little red, what are you doing? 
but that is a testament to how loved this show was. The entire thing relied on Tony and Vivian. Their charming personalities were so magnetic, you couldn't help but be drawn to them. Not being in a silly world surrounded by silly characters and needing to rely on basic practical effects and your own charisma isn't easy. I feel like with any other host, this show could have been a total flop. That's when you say you're sorry, it's the only thing to do. Being on Disney, naturally again, there were gonna be more songs. And they kill it every single time. I don't know what magical Disney juice they were drinking, but they had some serious pipes on them. You can leave it all behind. If you ever bought their DVDs, there were these bonus features, usually having Tony and Vivian creating simple DIY crafts that you could do at home. Have some pipe cleaners and some cotton balls and some clothespins. Great, so let's get started. All right. And they take their time with it. It goes on for like 10 minutes. They take their time and show you step by step on how to do it so you can follow along at home. They come off as genuine people in real life and it translates perfectly on screen. After a long busy day of crafts, we would be blessed with hearing one of the greatest goodbye songs known to man. So long, farewell to you, my friends. Goodbye for now. It's enough to make a grown man cry. Out of the Box was fantastic, showing that you didn't need non-stop ADHD nonsense to make a great show. All you need is some heart. Until we meet again. The Book of Pooh is surprisingly not an autobiography about me after I have 2am Taco Bell. Instead we follow the president of China, Winnie the Pooh. Probably the cutest and most down-to-earth piece of fiction ever created. Well, that's the last of it. Oh, bother. Pooh found he was clean out of honey. The show follows Pooh and all of his woodland friends we've grown to know and love, getting into fun shenanigans. I mean, what did you really expect? A horror movie? No, that would be later. What stands out though and makes this really unique is the puppetry work. But usually in kids shows that uses puppets, they often try to limit their movements or just outright focus on their upper half of the body. But the Book of Pooh has tons of movements, full body, characters dancing, walking, and just all around being more dynamic than most, if not all TV shows that used puppets at this time. Think, think, think. Oh, I remember. <clears throat> I wish I had a pot of honey. Again, it's that Disney magic and money at good use. The show's use of puppetry was based on Japanese bunraku. Alongside its practical effects and paper mache cutout style backgrounds, it feels like a pop-up book come to life. Oh, so that's why it's called the Book of Pooh. I feel so stupid. I'm surprised they never took this show on the road or anything, like in the form of a play, but what else can I say? Disney was not cheaping out with these shows, raising the bar in terms of quality for what's expected for children's programming. Boy, oh boy, there's nothing better than being a bird and being able to fly. Huh. Hello, Cassie. <laughs> Rabbit. I wish they'd return to this style, though. Puppeteering is definitely a dying art, with Sesame Street and Arlo being the only ones keeping it alive. Out of all the Winnie the Pooh adaptations that exist, I think I'd recommend this one the most. Alright, this is Stanley. I've got plenty of time before we leave to go shopping. In fact, I've got enough time to go drink a glass of orange juice. I don't know if this is wrong to say, but this kid is very punchable. Something about his voice immediately irritates me. Elephant sounds like it starts with L. I never watched this as a kid, so I'm kinda going in blind, and from the few episodes I've watched, we basically follow this kid, named Stanley, who's really into animals, and alongside his best friend Dennis, who is a talking goldfish, go on adventures revolving around animals and how animal facts can relate to a problem that Stanley is going through. A lot of people are scared of worms, but it's only because they don't know anything about them. I used to be scared of macaroni! That's about it. For example, there's an episode where Stanley loses a shoe and he's like, Hey, that reminds me, elephants never forget anything. The two are also in possession of a cursed book called The Great Big Book of Everything, and every episode has them opening it up and transporting them to a magic animal world, where they then go on magical animal adventures to learn about said animal. So, how are we gonna stand up to Ben? 
Let's get some stinging tentacles that tie up to our arms. I mean, I guess it's all right if you like animal facts and stuff, but Stanley is just so unlikable to me, I don't know how to explain it. He's the kind of kid who reads an animal fact once and then hits you with the erm actually when you get it wrong. Stupid Stanley. Chugga, chugga, big red car. The Wiggles. Big red car, we're gonna ride the whole day long. The Wiggles is an Australian music group. Now this show wasn't a homemade product of Playhouse Disney, but it played such an integral role, there's no way I couldn't mention it. The history of this group is so interesting and vast that I could do an entire video on their lives alone. Jeff Fat and Anthony Field were in a pop group known as The Cockroaches. One of their bandmates unfortunately passed away and the group disbanded. Later down the road though, they met Greg Page and Murray Cook, who were studying teaching and early childhood, and with their knowledge and experience combined, created the ultimate music group for kids. Wait for the traffic to come to a stop, then cross the road with a friend. The Wiggles show was just non-stop song after song, each one being a total banger that still holds up to this day. This is the heaviest song you will ever fucking hear! The heaviest song we have ever written! Spaghetti, I'm ready for a big piece of cheese. The guys were also a little bit older than most children's show hosts. I mean, to a kid, I'm pretty much their grandpa, but you know what I mean. Disney didn't let their age play a factor at all. They all let their talents and charms speak for themselves. And believe me, they spoke it with their whole chests. I don't have much else to say apart from just showing more songs. All of the Wiggles had this fun presence to them. The Wiggles as a group is actually still going on to this day, however with new band members. But Anthony is still in the group. He's apparently ride or die, which is awesome. So the fact that the Wiggles, even in a different form, are still rocking and kicking all these years later, has got to say something about him. In this show, we follow the Joestar bloodline hunting down that damn demon king known as Dio! Oh no, wait, that's not right. Jojo Circus follows a little clown girl named Jojo. She lives in a circus town. Yeah, an entire circus probably populated with clowns. My friend went there once and said everyone knew me. It was heartbreaking. The show was created by Jim Jenkins, remember that name? It's entirely done in stop motion and it's so fluid and clean. Again, for the time, I would have expected and fully understood if the stop motion was choppy and awkward, but no, it's super clean. Apparently being done by Jim Jenkins himself, his first project with stop motion. Some people spend years honing their craft, other people master it their first time. Hi, Jojo here. Sento Hamu. The show's structure is very reminiscent of Blue's Clues. Jojo will talk to the audience and ask us to help her with her problems, usually with a focus on exercising and movement. She'll ask the viewer at home to help clap their hands, jump, and stretch, along with her pet lion Goliath, and we gotta help her solve the problem of the day. <laughs> so hey, if there's one thing that Jojo Circus has taught us, is that even if you're a clown, People can still like you. Stop looking at me. Alright, I have no idea what the heck this is. I have never watched this in my entire life. Higgly Town Heroes. It looks like you two are about to become a perfectly proud pair of parents. This is definitely the show that was in the back of the line when it came to receiving its budget. So in this show, all of the characters are Russian nesting dolls. I guess because it's just less to animate. It was either give these characters legs or the animators don't eat for the year, so I guess they made the right choice. The show is definitely more content slot for children. It's colorful, has wacky movements and shapes, as well as their talking best friend who is random and the squirrel. There's an episode where it hijacks NASA and flies into space on a spaceship. And I must be on a rocket ship. I'm the first squirrel in space. Oh, come on, a squirrel who's an astronaut? That's ridiculous. Apart from that, uh, I, I have nothing else to really talk about. If you grew up with this show, then please enlighten me in the comments so I can properly appreciate the true art of Hugly Higgly Town Heroes. What's this thing called? Now, I don't want to come off as mean or anything, but I don't like British people. However, there are a few exceptions. 
two of which go by the names of Charlie and Lola. This stone is ancient. It's really, really, really old. Did it come from Granny's garden? Charlie and Lola is actually a book series created in 2000, and then in 2005 was picked up by Playhouse Disney to turn into a cartoon. Oh. <laughs> well, I didn't get chocolate spread on my dress. It's a very sweet show, especially if you have siblings. Me being an older brother myself, I always have an appreciation for shows like this. Seeing the older brother needing to deal with their younger sibling getting into trouble. I don't need to get my hair cut, Charlie. I like my hair completely the way it is. But Mum says... <laughs> Lola is a very carefree girl and just living her best life. Not a single thought is happening in that head. Which usually means it's up to Charlie to be the adult and help out his little sister in whatever she needs. Why do we have to bury him? It's what you do when your mouse dies. Charlie and Lola capture that essence of brother and sisterhood perfectly, caring for each other deeply while simultaneously, sometimes, driving the other one insane. Yes, yes, Charlie, I'm hopping. I'm hopping. I'm hopping. The visuals are also really unique. It looks exactly like the books. Everyone is crudely drawn and colored in like a child scribbling with crayon, but some of the textures look like actual fabrics and paper cutouts. All of this combined really makes the world feel like a storybook come to life. The show also uses actual children for the voice acting, and they do a good job. Okay, Charlie, um, stop scribbling. No. Okay. I can't say scribbling. You can. <laughs> Just said it. Mainly because the script isn't written like a sitcom or anything. It's written like actual dialogue children would have with each other. Can I do the sound effect for the giraffe seizing? Yeah, you can. <laughs> and with their British accents, it's pretty cute. I'll give them that. Oh, can I go to Lou? Charlie and Lola won all sorts of awards, and rightfully so. A nice and quiet cartoon that showed a more realistic approach to having a sibling. Johnny and the Sprites. Hey, if those sprites are from McDonald's, I'm all in. So I've never actually watched this show until working on this video, and I gotta say, it's pretty good. We follow our main character, Johnny. He inherits a house from his uncle, but it just so happens that the forest surrounding the house is home to these little creatures called fairies. And together, they all live in harmony and sing songs and dance. Clean and green, taking care of the land, the water, and the sky. I mean, it sounds cheesy when I say it, but like, that's exactly what the show is. Again, I really gotta praise the use of the puppets. They're all very cute. All the veggies are green and healthy again. <laughs> and the air smells sweet! Uh, I mean, honestly, that's it. That's all I gotta say. It's a little too, like whimsical for my liking. I know I'm watching it from the perspective of an adult and not a kid, but even as a kid, this show just wasn't my speed. It's charming for sure though, very wholesome, lots of silly adventures that result in a song being sung every two minutes. I liked it, don't get me wrong. I just got nothing else to say. You ever thought to yourself what the Wiggles would look like on acid? Well, here you go. You get the Doodle Bops. I'm Didi Doodle. I was kind of joking, but also kind of not. This show is pretty much The Wiggles, but more insane and unhinged. Instead of four Australian gentlemen singing songs about friendship and sharing, we got these monsters living in an optical illusion house with all kinds of drug related adventures. They're an in-universe band, which is pretty cool. Usually every episode ends with them going on a stage and performing a song. Apparently they did tons of live shows, which is pretty cool. This is the kind of stuff kids would love to see live. Colorful monsters on crazy sets singing addicting songs that will still be playing on the ride home. The show itself was all right. The Doodle Bops having adventures and needing to learn about sharing and stuff. <laughs> you know, I was just getting a little too old around this time to be an actual fan, so while I never watched it personally, I remember seeing toys and posters all over the place with these guys. A nightmare to some, but a national treasure to others. Play that music! 
Now, there's more shows we're going to be talking about in this video. However, around this time, which is 2005, I was kind of done with children's programming, but I'm still going to try my best to show them all some love. You'll just have to bear with me if I don't go super deep into them. I'm trying my best here. Alright, so this isn't your average little baby show where they teach you about coloring and stuff. Oh no, Little Einsteins is for... Little Einsteins. Usually they go over topics that cover classical music and art. We have to start at Adagio. Pat the beat on your lap slowly. Mmm, yes, it's quite highbrow and donish. The magniloquence this show exudes is indeed very exemplary. Peanuts! Seriously, bro, look at this show. This little nerd here is teaching you about things like moderato. Did I even say that right? Moderato! This kid is absolutely schooling me. I feel a bit embarrassed. I'll give the show props for sure. Being able to talk so deeply about music and art is very admirable. Most kids shows have songs, sure, but you're never really learning anything about the history or important creations that have influenced generations of artists to follow, or just the technical aspects of music. Teaching real life history and application is definitely a challenge. Kids could easily find it boring, but the show does a good job of working with it. The historical figures will usually take on some kind of silly form or have an exaggerated representation of their music. Little Einstein's doesn't hold back. Your kid could actually learn something from watching this, which I think is super cool. Also, for being a show with a focus on music history, the few songs they do have are god-awful. The Golden Goose! The Golden Goose! Golden Goose! The show was a bit too smart for me. Yeah, I'm not afraid to admit it. So thank you, Little Einstein's. Without you, I would never would have learned about Claude Debussy. Is that real? Only one way for you to find out. Alright, here's a show that needs no explanation or even deep dive. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Hi everybody! Wow, it sure is great to see ya! I'm gonna keep this section pretty short because like, what can I really say? It's Mickey Mouse and friends hanging out and having fun. Well, if red means stop, then green means go. Do the green, do the green! That's it! It's the perfect show to put in front of a child to shut him up for a few hours. It's probably why to this day this show is being live streamed on YouTube. Colorful Disney mascots, I mean of course this show was gonna be a hit. I'm surprised it took until 2006 for a Mickey Mouse cartoon to exist here. It ran for 10 years coming to an end in 2016. Which is definitely the longest running Playhouse Disney show so far. If you watch this let me know your favorite episode in the comments below. My favorite one was when Mickey Mouse fought the Heartless with Roxas. Handy Manny is the whitest Hispanic man I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Guys, it's only 3 o'clock. The New Year's Eve celebration doesn't start for another few hours. This show is literally just, what if Bob the Builder wasn't British and was instead Mexican? That's it, Roll Tide. Manny is a handyman who goes on fixing adventures with his talking tools, as well as learning a bit of Spanish along the way. So yeah, it's Dora meets Bob the Builder. I mean, it's alright. It's not as charming as Bob the Builder since I like the claymation more, but at least Manny isn't British, so that's a win. As a whole, it's still a fun little show that could get kids into carpentry, which is really nice. And having some Hispanic representation is definitely cool. Manny himself is voiced by Wilmer Valderrama, aka Fez from that 70s show. And maybe it's just me, but he sounds... Not so into it. Hmm, we're right by Gary's garage. We should have him take a look at it just in case we need his help. I don't know, man. Every time Manny talks, he just sounds like he doesn't want to be there. I know, but the camioneta is very old. It just may finally be time to get a new one. Ah. Uh... But all the other characters and tools are voiced by talented voice actors. You got Tom Kenny, Gray Delisle, Kath Susie. It's an all-star lineup. Just one question, Manny. Why drop a ball? Why not a box, or a shoe, or a hammer? Handy Manny also ran for seven years, coming to an end in 2013. We bought too many games, now we gotta play them all. All aboard the Soul Train! This is Choo Choo Soul. Give a little whistle, give a little whistle. 
Your main conductors are Genevieve Goings and DC Abramson, where the two sing songs and dance. I mean, what more do you expect from a Disney show at this point? The seaweed is always greener in somebody else's lake. You dream about going up there, but that is a big mistake. I've actually never heard of this in my life. Choo Choo Soul actually started out as a collaboration between video game composer Greg Johnson, sound designer Burke Treishman, sorry if I mispronounced that, and Genevieve Goings herself. They were all recording dialogue for Toe Jam and Earl 3 Mission to Earth for the OG Xbox. Genevieve would be riffing melodies, and they all realized they kind of have some magic here. And in 2004, they released an album that was described as music for kids that won't drive parents crazy. But I can't find it anywhere online. Then in 2006, Disney picked them up for some shorts, and here we are. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, J, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. It's some interesting choo-choo soul lore you didn't ask for. Which is good, because I don't really have anything else to say about the show. However, they've seemed to do a lot of live shows, which I really commend. True performers at heart. From what I was able to find, they toured 56 cities throughout the band's life. Because of that, I'm sure kids had a lot more of a connection to this group, and I think that's really sweet. Lou and Lou's Safety Patrol follows two dorky kids trying to enforce safety and cringe onto others. Oh, how are you, doggy? Not so fast, Bonnie. Uh-oh. You have a safety violation. These were all shorts that aired during commercials, probably all lasting about maybe three minutes. And honestly, it's bad. Wait a minute, Bonnie. You've got a violation. My candy bar? Candy bars are not very nutrim... Nutritious. Nutritious. Yeah. Seriously, these kids are so annoying. Their whole gimmick is that they butt into other people's lives to say, Erm, that's not safe. Technically, you should be doing it like this. He isn't doing anything. He should be getting exercise to keep his body fit and healthy. Like, dog, shut up before I smack you. No joke, every time these kids talk, just look at the other characters. Even they hate them. Why are you talking to me about healthy snacks and wearing helmets? That's lame! You're a dork! If you need to reach for something high, use a step stool. Or ask a grown-up. Why is this show getting me so riled up? Who liked this? If you liked Lou and Lou Safety Patrol, that's a violation. And you're a dork. Alright, now this is more my speed. Ooh, on you follows two silly monkeys getting into shenanigans. Can't I just have a few? Okay, you know what? I need your help. You see, Ooh still wants potato chips. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this time. Now, this is quality TV. Just like the Safety Patrol, these shows were shorts that aired during commercials or just to fill in some leftover time. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ah, ooh, ah, yippee, ah, yay. The show, I'll be honest wasn't very deep. Just two monkeys monkeying around. They sing songs, have silly banter, it's all around just a fun time. We love bananas! Mm -hmm. Oh, you're right! The show was created by Jason Hopley and Jamie Shannon. If you don't know them by name, you definitely recognize their work. Creating shows like Nana Land and Mr. Meaty. So come on down! Yeah, these guys who created man-made horrors beyond comprehension also made the fun little Disney monkey show. Could you please be a little more quiet? Oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll try to be more quiet, okay? Thank you. Uh, uh, the best part of being a star! The two obviously have a fun sense of humor and are super creative. Ooh Ah and You ran from 2005 to 2011. All of the segments were about two minutes in length, and I feel like that's a good amount before the show would probably get old. Come out, come out, where- You're right there. No, I'm not. You're, you're right there. No, I'm not, I'm hiding. But I really enjoyed what I watched. You could say, I went bananas for it. Thank you. All right, well, speaking of nightmares, here's Go Baby. Baby is getting ready for Sophie's birthday party. <laughs> say hi to Baby. Man, I hate this. I don't know how to explain this animation style. They're just pictures of babies, but cut out and animated. It reminds me of the Canadians from South Park. Canadian Prince now dipping his arms into the pudding. 
as is tradition. It's not cute. It's horrifying. If you wanted babies to fill in some time, why not just film real babies doing cute things? Oh, ah! look. It's Butterfly. Butterfly has a surprise for us. And what's wrong with me? Why am I beefing with literal babies? To the babies in this show who are now definitely adults, I'm sorry for bullying baby you. My friends, Tigger and Pooh. Now, unlike the last Winnie the Pooh show, this one doesn't have anything for me to really talk about. Just like Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, it's Pooh and friends hanging out. Instead of Christopher Robin, though, the main human we follow is a little girl named Darby. She's voiced by Chloe Grace Moretz, who I would literally die for. Apart from that, uh... Yep, that's it. I wish they just revived the Book of Pooh and stuck to the uniqueness of that. But, I get it, this CGI was probably way cheaper. Can you teach my alligator manners? What? My name is Mikey, and this is Al. He's fun and friendly and my very best pal. Oh god, that is the worst theme song I've ever heard. So, as the name suggests, we follow this kid who wants to adopt an alligator, and his mom says he can, but only if the alligator gets taught manners. Thus, here we are. Al, sweetie, please don't kick the back of Grandma's seat. Now that I think about it, this is Lou and Lou Safety Patrol done right. The show is obviously meant to teach kids about manners. You know, saying please and thank you, shaking hands, listening before speaking. You get it, you probably have manners. Right? Al, aren't you forgetting something? You forgot to say thank you. The alligator's name is Al, which is just so creative, but he's also a massive dick, which is kind of funny. Like, this alligator not saying please is the least of your worries. This is Tasty Time with Zefranc. Bonjour, everyone. That means hello in French. Probably racist, but it's okay. Nobody likes the smelly French. In this show, we follow Zefranc, who is a talking, cooking wiener dog. And his friends, who are a bird and a raccoon, they mess with him. Dumb! You said you did not like tomatoes. They were surprisingly delicious. It's another short, with episodes lasting around three minutes, so there's not much you can really do, but it's still a fun and chaotic little time. Whoa! Cats and water do not mix. You want to cook? You have to wash. The characters are voiced by Rob Paulson and Mark Hamill. This is an insanely talented lineup of actors that are used for this random three-minute short. At the end of each episode, we'd also see a father and daughter cook the meal that Zefranc was trying to cook. It's really nice and sweet, getting to actually learn a recipe and how to cook. However, in later episodes and later airings, these segments were cut entirely due to time constraints. Dude, this is the stuff that's actually kind of interesting. But what can you do? For a short, it was charming and fun. Have you ever thought to yourself what the Wiggles would be like if they lost their jobs and started a moving company? Imagination movers are music to your ears. We're music to your ears. Well, you'd get Imagine Movers. Yeah, it's kind of a weird concept. Like, why a moving company of all things? I'll admit it is kind of funny because the group are just a bunch of dudes. We're not furniture movers. We're imagination movers. They don't look like children show hosts or super handsome members of a boy band. They look like actual movers who are just singing and dancing their little hearts out. I'm blowing bubbles in the backyard. Amen. Second verse, same as the first. They go on adventures, learn lessons, and sing. Where is Warehouse Mouse? He's in a warehouse. Thanks for watching. We follow a mouse in a warehouse. He gets into mischief. The end. It's another three minutes short, so there's naturally not gonna be a lot going on. But hey, I will give it props for going back to puppetry. Yeah, in 2009, puppets were pretty much long gone apart from the obvious exceptions. It's super cute and a perfect nothing show with no stakes, plots, or even characters. Just a mouse puppet living his best life.
Special Agent Oso follows a Special Agent Panda Bear who works for the United Network of Investigating Quite Usual Events, or Unique for short. Something about this CGI feels even more reminiscent of those bootleg Disney movies. Like, there's no way you're gonna tell me this looks any different than A Car's Life. I wish I could be... Sparky, stop. This is not a musical. No, it's a gulag. If you can look past that, though, it's a fine enough show. Adventures, learning... Yay! How many times have I said that? I was, like, almost in high school by the time this came out, and as an adult, there's nothing really here I can appreciate. It's not like how I watch Bluey nowadays, where it'll actually make me cry and stuff. Jungle Junction. This show makes me laugh. Not because it's, like, funny or anything, necessarily, but more so just because, like, what am I looking at? All of these animals have wheels instead of legs. Like, it's gotta be a cost-saving measure, right? Like, there's no in-universe reason as to why these talking animals don't have legs, apart from it's cheaper to animate. Apart from that... It's fine. It's another CGI kid show where they go on adventures, sing songs, and have a fun, magical time. Yes! This one! Pinky Dinky Doo! This is where our journey comes to an end. Playhouse Disney ran until 2011, where it was then rebranded to Disney Junior. Pretty much the same thing, airing children's programming, just now under a new name. As I've mentioned a hundred times, I definitely wasn't in the age range come 2005-ish. But there's no denying the impact and influence Playhouse Disney had on kids. So many creative shows that truly set a precedent and a standard as to what's expected for kids. High quality shows with a lot of heart. And while I always did prefer Nick Jr. personally, there's no denying that, just like everything Disney does, they go all out. And I have so many friends that will still tear up if they see Bear in the Big Blue House. They won't admit it, but I know it's happening. Alright, now I went on Twitter, which you can follow, at Connor DeWaffle, and I put this here saying, what's your favorite Playhouse Disney memory, show, thoughts, whatever? Your replies will be in a video. And I got a lot of replies. We got lovely things like people praising ooh ooh and ah. Oh, uh, let's see here. While watching PB&J Otter with my friend's younger siblings, I told them that peanut butter and jelly were made from otters, and that's why their names were PB&J. I wasn't allowed over their house for a little while after that. Good show, though. Okay. Objectively evil, but funny. Here we go! Somebody who watched this show! This joint had me twerking in my tidy whities every time. Okay. Chugga chugga chugga. Okay. Uh, let's see, Stanley is such an underrated show. It was the main thing that made me really want to learn more about the world. I used to carry a dictionary and pretend it was the big, great big book of everything. Okay, well, I, I don't want to be mean, so I will give that a like. <laughs> oh, now we're getting to people's age here. You know, I don't see anyone bring up Jungle Junction ever. This is basically lost to time. This is, this proves, this is, you were definitely young. You were born probably 2005. <laughs> Okay, so this is kind of funny. I rarely ever see anyone mention Jojo Circus. And then right underneath it, big picture of Jojo Circus. Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, what's this? What? what? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for putting that there in the video. My favorite Playoffs Disney memory was when I was, when I, when I see June and Jojo having meet and greets. That's awesome, what? Bro, that's cool as hell, no way. Wait, what's this? They also did an official crossover with shows from PBS Kids and Nick? What? Oh yeah, there's Jimmy Neutron, Roly Poly Oli, uh... What is going on? Hey, yo! Oh, well it's copyrighted music, so I can't play that, but... That's really cool, it's just like, it's like a montage... Of all these shows, what's this for? Just after the 9-11 attacks, uh-oh. In an unprecedented display of interspecies unity. Okay, so that's nice. They had like an official crossover. You know. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Bear in the big blue house. He could take Al-Qaeda one-on-one. -on -one. But with that, I hope you enjoyed our little stroll down memory lane. Let me know your favorite Playhouse Disney or Disney Junior show down below. Since there's a very real chance that some of you were born after 2011. And honestly, that hurts my soul a little bit. Until next time. <laughs>